The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in that chapter, most of which we have read at the beginning, namely the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, verse 27, the 27th verse in the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now those words, you remember, were spoken by our blessed Lord and Savior, in particular to his own disciples, who were at this time very troubled indeed, and troubled because he had just made it perfectly plain and clear to them that he was about to leave them, to die, to be taken from them, and that they should no longer enjoy his physical presence with them. The whole context of this particular text which we are looking at tonight, therefore, was spoken in that particular setting and background. These men were in a condition of acute crisis. Their world seemed to be collapsing beneath them. And for a moment they were staggered and didn't quite know where they were, nor what they could do. And it was in that kind of circumstance that our Lord made this categorical statement, Peace I leave with you. My peace, the peace that I've enjoyed myself and of which I am the author, I give unto you. Now, I'm calling your attention to this for obvious reasons. We've been on a number of Sunday evenings now looking at the present situation in which we find ourselves in a, a general way, showing how the Scriptures, how the Bible, alone explains why such situations keep on recurring, why it is that in a world that has never been so well educated and so on, that there should still be these problems which have characterized the life of men uh, throughout the centuries. That is a very great problem, and it behoves us uh, to look at it in general in that way, as we have been doing, and we have seen, that in the Bible there is a perfectly simple and clear explanation of it all. But now this evening, I am inviting you to look at the whole position with me from a slightly different angle. Here our Lord speaks in a more personal way and deals, if you like, with this kind of situation. What has the gospel to offer to me in this situation? What does it offer to do for me? Well, now, I am suggesting this evening that in these words that we are going to look at together, we are face to face with what is, after all, the essence of what the gospel says and what it claims to do and what it offers to anybody who receives it and believes it. And let us observe that what our Lord offered and promised here was abundantly fulfilled later in the lives and the experiences of these very disciples to whom the words were spoken. You'll see that in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, take just one man as an illustration, the Apostle Peter, who was very fearful, very disturbed about all this, as he always was every time our Lord even mentioned his death. Far be it from thee, says Peter. He couldn't contemplate the thing. And you remember that when our blessed Lord was arrested and was on trial, Peter, animated by a natural curiosity, slipped into the courtroom to hear the proceedings and to see what happened and was challenged. And the maid suggested that he belong to this prisoner, this Christ. And Peter was so alarmed and terrified that he denied his Lord and said that he didn't know him and had nothing to do with him. He did so even with oaths and cursing. Well, you turn over to the book of the Acts of the Apostles and you'll find that that selfsame Peter who was so craven-spirited and so cowardly in spite of all his arrogance and his boastfulness, the Peter who could always talk big, but who didn't come out very well in a crisis and in a trial, that same man later on 
is a fulfillment of this promise here given by our Lord. He can speak with a holy boldness. He can defy the authorities. He's not afraid of anybody. He has received this gift of peace that has enabled him to become a master of his circumstances and of his situation. And he is therefore a fulfillment and a verification of this very thing that our Lord here claims. Now here I say is one of the great central claims of this Christian faith. It claims that it can give us peace even in this world as it is. This is one of its central offers. And uh, therefore I say, we must look into this. It promises us that if we but receive it and take it and live by it, we can know peace in the midst of a storm. Peace in the very midst of tribulations. Now, let's approach it in this way. The test of any teaching or of any view or philosophy of life, is uh, simply this. What is it like in a crisis? Now, everybody listening to me at this moment has got some view of life or other. We've all got some sort of a working philosophy. And we say, now, that's my view. That's how I see things. And you are living according to your view. Now, we can agree about this, I'm certain, that the test of any view, whatever it is, is how does it stand up to a crisis, to a test? You see, any sort of view can say a great deal for itself when there isn't much of a problem and when there isn't much of a difficulty. When the sun is shining and everything is going well, well, almost every view of life can say a great deal in favor of itself. Ah, but that isn't the test. If a view claims to be a view of life, that it has covered the whole of life, comprehended every eventuality and every contingency, well, then I say its test rarely arrives when something untoward happens. When you find yourself suddenly surrounded by problems and trials and tribulations, when suddenly there comes something that tests you to the very depth. Does it hold you then? Does it help you then? Is it adequate to such a situation? Now then, let me put it still more personally. Is your view of life standing the test of the present circumstances? I mean by that, are you enjoying peace in your heart and in your mind? Are you untroubled today? Can you say that you really are at ease? Is this view that you've got and which you've always defended and put forward, is it really emerging out of the present test successfully and triumphantly? I want to go further and put a second question. It is possible even for us to delude ourselves that we are Christians. So you see that a time like this, a time of crisis and of testing, is also a most excellent test of our profession of the Christian faith. You see, there are many people who say, oh yes, of course I'm a Christian. I was christened when I was a child. I've always been brought up to be a Christian. Of course I'm a Christian. And yet you find sometimes that such people, when they are up against some test or crisis, just don't know where they are at all. And what they have called their faith doesn't help them to the slightest extent. They're exactly as if they were not Christians. There is no difference between them and the people who are out in the world. You notice that our Lord here has a great division between those who are Christians and those who are in the world. He says, I'm not going to manifest myself to the world. I am to the Christian. The Christian shall have the Holy Ghost in him. The world shan't. It can't believe him. It can't receive him because it doesn't see him. Now I say that there are many people who've always regarded themselves as Christians. But haven't you found sometimes that such people, when they're taken ill, or when some loved one is taken ill, or when they're on their deathbed, or somebody else who's dear to them is on his or her deathbed, they don't seem to be helped by their Christianity at all. 
They're exactly as if they'd never professed it. It's a very good test, therefore, of our profession. Those who claim to be Christians in this congregation, therefore, this evening, shall I ask you a question? Is your faith holding you at this moment? Are you able to rest upon it? Are you enjoying this peace about which our Lord here speaks? Now that is, I say, the whole question, because our blessed Lord and Savior himself has pointed out that terrible possibility to us in his well-known parable of the sower. You see, he says, there's a farmer who goes scattering the seed. Some falls by the wayside. It's picked up at once by the birds of the air. Well, that's the end of that. Yes, but there's other seed that falls onto some kind of hard ground, some stony ground. And it does get a sort of root and it sprouts up quickly. Yes, but he says, when persecutions and trials and tribulation comes, it ceases. There appeared to be life. There wasn't really. Then he says that there is other seed that falls amongst the thorns. And he says this again appears to put up a good show, but uh, it's soon strangled by these thorns. What are the thorns? The cares of this life, this world, and the deceitfulness of riches. They choke the word. So that I say that we, at a time like this, are of necessity, if we are thinking people at all, forced to examine ourselves and to test ourselves. If what you call your Christian faith isn't making all the difference in the world to you this evening, well then I say you'd better examine the foundations again. Is it a Christian faith at all? Because this is what the Christian faith offers. This is what the Christian faith gives. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Very well, let's look at this together. Our Lord here surely reminds us of and puts his finger upon what is in many ways the central problem of life in this world for all of us. And what is that? Well, it's the problem of anxiety and the problem of fear. Let not your heart be troubled, he says, that means anxious. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And by that word afraid, he really means being afraid. He means being alarmed and terrified, as it were, and dithering because you don't know where you are nor what to do. Now, I say that this is the great problem, and it's never been a greater problem than it is at this present hour. Again, surely there'll be no difference of opinion about that. You don't need to be a Christian today to agree that the greatest problem confronting the human race at this moment is the problem of anxiety and the problem of fear. This is literally being admitted and granted by all observers of life. You'll hear it constantly on the wireless, you'll read it in the books, and you'll see it in the journals. This is in the newspapers, it's everywhere. The great modern problem is the problem of anxiety and of fear. Uh, what's it mean? Well, it means that there is a lack of a sense of security. There is an absence of rest and of peace and an ultimate equanimity in the lives of men and women speaking generally. You are familiar with the fact that the great medical problem of this age is in a sense the problem of the neuroses the problems of the phobias, the problem of the psychoses. This is the urgent problem confronting men today. It's the great medical problem, I say. It takes many forms. Uh, first and foremost, the fear of life itself. People are feeling increasingly that life itself is a burden and a problem which is baffling. And they're afraid of life. And then there is a fear of the future. The world that seemed so stable a hundred years ago to the Victorians is no longer stable. And the most acute observers today, I say not only those who are Christian, but those who are not Christian, 
The most acute observers today are unanimous in saying that mankind has a, a terrible and a terrifying feeling that we are all in the grip, as it were, of certain great irrational forces that are tending to manipulate the life of men in this world and seem to be hurtling us all together to disaster. Now, what I mean by that is this. The irrational forces, which would have been so unthinkable to the Victorians and indeed even to the Edwardians, are things like uh, fascism and communism and their ways and their philosophies. Both are equally irrational. This belief in force, this belief in power, this incalculable element that comes in, this failure to uh, recognize uh, what uh, one would have assumed 50 years ago were accepted standards uh, with regard to cruelty and the way to treat one another. All that has been thrown into the melting pot. And man has never been so inhuman to men as he's been in the last 30 years. The torture to which people are subjected. Now, there's are irrational fossils. The world had come to the opinion and the conclusion that everybody was agreed about this sort of thing. Now, there was a certain kind of code. They talked about honor even in war. But all that's gone. And we seem to be facing some elemental forces, some powers that have come up out of the jungle again, and these seem to be dominating the lives of men. No respect for law and order, a pledged word, it means nothing, and people are just being governed by their desires and their lusts and their passions. It's all irrational. Now, that is the kind of thing, you see, that is leading to this modern sense of insecurity. And the result is that the modern men speaking generally is not conscious of any sense of stability. He feels he's got no anchor for his life. The whole future seems to be uncertain and in the melting pot. There is no place of rest and of peace and of quiet. Well, let's leave it at that. That's the problem. I've been just picturing it to you again. There is the thing that I say everybody is agreed about. That is the most urgent problem this evening. Now then, the whole question is as to what you're going to do about it. So that I come to our Lord's second proposition, which is this. That that being the problem, it is a problem with which the world itself cannot deal. Peace I leave with you, he says, my peace I give unto you, then the negative. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Ah, yes, he knew, as we know, that the world is always offering its peace. That is why the world, you see, doesn't turn to Christ. That's the problem. Why is it that, as things are this evening, that the whole world of men is not turning back to God? Not looking in the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ who is called the Prince of Peace. Why not? Well, because they believe that they can discover peace in their own ways. He, he says it's impossible. But the world is still claiming it. Let's look at its methods. There are some, you know, who seem to be trying to find a certain amount of peace for themselves by just refusing to face the facts at all. That's their method of doing it. They just will not face the facts. Now, I came across an instance of this the other night. I think, if I'm right, it was Thursday night. I got home somewhat late and wasn't able to have my evening meal until after nine o'clock. And there, having my meal, I saw on the wireless program that they had what they called, I think, the scrapbook for 1937. And I listened with great interest because I thought, well, now then, it, it isn't a bad thing at this time of present crisis uh, just to be reminded again of what people were like in 1937. I remembered it. I've often referred to it from this pulpit. But I thought, oh, I'm a Christian preacher. I may have a prejudice about this. Let's hear what the world's got to say about the pre-39 mentality, 1937, just two years before the Second World War broke out. What were people like? Hitler had come into power in 1933. 
A man like Sir Winston Churchill was giving his solemn warnings. Things were happening, one after another. But what was the reaction? Well, this scrapbook for 1937 gave me the answer to the question. They pictured, you see, various types of people. They reminded us of the things that people were doing in 1937. And they gave us a picture of quite an ordinary family. A man was there entertaining some of his friends. They'd come in to spend the evening with him. But they put on the nine o'clock news. And the news reporter was reading out his report. Uh, Hitler had said this and had done that. And Mussolini was threatening this. And the man who was entertaining his friend said, Shut it off! Ah, we can't be bothered with it. Shut it off! And they shut off the news in order that they could go on with their drinking and their pleasure and their joviality. He thought, you see, he was finding peace. Because he shuts off the wireless, he's at peace again. He hasn't heard the bad news. Throw your newspaper into the fire or out through the window of your railway compartment. Pull down your blinds. Shut off the wireless. Put off the television. Don't listen to these things if it's disturbing or if it makes you feel miserable. Shut them out. And well, let's just go on. And they call that peace. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you, says our Lord. Thank God that's not his method. He's realistic. He faces the facts. But let's look at another method for a moment. There are those who do listen to the news right through to the bitter end. And they're made miserable, of course. You can't listen to it without being caused to think and to ponder. And this element of fear tends to come in. But they deal with it like this, you see. Immediately they put on some pleasure or some entertainment. Something to take your mind off it, to erase it out of your memory. And that's their way of trying to persuade themselves that they have found peace. You so fill yourself with something else. Fill your mind and your whole outlook with it. That you're no longer thinking about the other. It's an extraordinary thing how you can do that with your mind, you know. You can push one thing out by filling it with another. And people do that quite deliberately. And the purveyors of pleasure, of course, they know that perfectly well. And that is why they so do this kind of thing at such a time and rarely believe that they're helping us. That's another conception of peace. Another method is what is called wishful thinking, of course. And that just means that you say to yourself, oh, well, of course the news was bad, but no doubt everything's going to be all right. And if, if you know a type of man who says that, well, when you're feeling rather depressed, you go and visit him. You know he'll make you feel better. He always sees a way out of it. It's all going to be all right. I remember a perfect instance of this again in August 1939, when I was on my holiday in a certain seaside resort. There was a man there. His business was just to take people out in... Uh, pleasure trips in his little boat. But the man was a bit of a psychologist, you see, and he knew that everybody was depressed by the news. That morning, one particular morning, I remember, the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop agreement had just been announced in the papers, the Russia-German pact, and it was thoroughly depressing. This man put a notice up outside his little booth where he... Uh, gave out his tickets for the little trips in the boat. And on there he put this, there will be no war. And everybody looked at it and smiled at one another. They went out in the boats on the trips and they felt better. Peace. <laughs> Very well, I think you're quite right in laughing at it, but you examine yourself and see how often you do the same thing to yourself. Wishful thinking. There will be no war. Can't be. Then let me hurry to a still more definite application of psychology. There's a great deal of this at the present time. And the more of it there is, the greater proof is it of this dis-ease. This restlessness, this unhappiness, this fear of life that is gripping the vast majority of people today. And so you will find the cults are thriving. Training as to how to handle yourself and to handle your mind. Psychology in its various forms and all its suggestions and all its auto-suggestion. Why there is even a vogue in how to relax physically in order to have peace in your mind. They say, you know, your body controls a great deal of your mind. It's perfectly right. And it's a good thing that we should relax our bodies. But you see, they're pinning their faith in this. Relax your body and your mind will be relaxed. Yoga, have you read about it? That method, people are going in for it. Why? Well, because they're troubled. 
Their minds are not at rest and they'll jump at anything that offers to give them this rest and peace of mind. Others try it by means of stoicism. What's that? Well, this is just this sort of attitude that says the news is bad. Things are going from bad to worse. All I say is this. I'm not going to whimper and cry and run away. I'm going to stick it. I'm going to be a man. That's not peace, my friend, but many persuade themselves it is peace. Just putting up a bold front. There's a great deal to be admired in it. I'm not criticizing it, nor essentially criticizing any of the others, except to say this, that not one of them gives you peace. It's a very good thing to be relaxed, but don't make the mistake of thinking that that is the peace about which our Lord spoke. And indeed, anybody who tries these things knows that it isn't. And then finally, of course, and this is a tremendous problem, even a financial one, the attempt to find peace by means of drugs. The most popular drug of today, as you all know, is the phenobarbitum, in one or other of its forms. People are just kept going by being drugged. They can't sleep without them. They can't face the day without them. Sometimes it's alcohol. Sometimes it's other things. Men and women are living on sedatives. Why? Why this? I say there's only one answer. They haven't got peace. And they're trying desperately to get it. But you see, none of these things give peace. And for this obvious and simple reason that not a single one of them gets you to face the problem. Not one of them. They're all methods of escape. Somehow or another, they're all trying to treat you a reaction to the problem instead of treating you yourself face to face with the problem. They don't really face the problem. They are simply a feeble attempt to medicate the symptoms that this terrible disease is producing in such a protean manner at this present time. Very well, then there our Lord's words are surely justified. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And thank God it isn't. I'm not in this pulpit tonight to say, cheer up, everything's all right. I'm not here to put on a bright and cheerful and happy service so that while you're in this building, at any rate, you won't be thinking about the problem. You'll be enjoying some chorus or some clowning or something else. No, no, that's not gospel. That's psychology. That's the world's method. It isn't Christ's method. What is his method? Well, here is his method. He gives us this peace by, first of all, exposing to us the true cause of our unrest. You know, there is no book in the world tonight that is as realistic as this book. People say, ah, oh, that's a fairy tale. Sob stuff, dope of the people. This is the only honest, the only realistic book in the world tonight. It exposes the whole cause of our dis-ease, our unrest, our lack of stability are becoming victims of circumstances instead of going through with this peace about which our Lord speaks. What is the exposure? What is the central call, cause of all this unrest? Are you ready for it? Are you really ready for it? I'll tell you what it is. It's self. Self which is just another name, if you like, for sin. But that's the whole cause of the trouble. Let me show you now how it works. I'm only going to give you a very superficial analysis tonight because of time. But you see, self works like this. Self leads to ambition. Self leads to pride. Self leads to self-importance. Self always leads to selfishness. Self always leads to self-will. And uh, when you examine the things that uh, cause you lack of ease and that upset you and cause your nerves to be frayed and makes you frightened of the whole of life and of the future, you'll find that it's always in terms of one or the other of those things, perhaps all of them together at the same time. We're afraid of losing something. 
something we've got, something we want. We're afraid that somebody else will have it. We're afraid that somebody else will go ahead of us or be more important than we are or more wealthy than we are or cut a greater figure. And so self, you see, with its self-protection and watching itself is always on edge and it's a terrible strain. You're not only doing your work, you're always watching these other factors as well. And not only that, self always demands what it wants and that always comes into conflict with somebody else who's exactly the same and who wants perhaps the same thing and there is trouble and confusion of what is called national sovereignty at this present time. And these nations, you see, listen to them on the wall as saying it one after another, we fight to the last man, my country, pride and nothing else. And every single nation in the world is guilty of this. Everyone, this one included, pride. And it's true of every single individual. This is the main result of sin. It's made man self-centered. It puts himself up, his ego. He's a little world, a cosmos in himself. And everything revolves round and about him. And you see, man isn't big enough for that sort of thing. And because he's taken on a job that's too big for himself, he's overstrained and he's tired and he's fearful and his nerves have gone to pieces. That's how self works in us ourselves. But you know, it affects others also. And in a sense, children that are born into this world are not given a chance by the modern view of life and the modern way of living. It's not surprising that they find life difficult and that the young people are having perhaps a harder time today than young people have ever had. I'm full of sympathy with them. I'm sorry for them. They've come into a world that is such as I've been describing. And you see, it's come about like this. So many of them are never really given a taste of the inestimable value and blessing of home life. Their parents are always out. Selfishness in the parents. In order to have more money for more pleasure, the mother perhaps goes out to work. She needn't of necessity. Some have to. I regret. I know it's true. But there are many who don't have to. But in order that they may have certain pleasures, they do. And the poor child is neglected or the children are neglected. That's self, you see, that's selfishness. And the little child is losing a whole basis to its life. The thing that, all, that always ought to be there as a foundation, like a rock that's immovable, the family, it isn't there. And it's true of all classes. At the other end of the financial and the social scale, there are parents who ensure selfishness Instead of bringing up their own children in their own homes, send them off to boarding schools. And the little child knows very little about a father and a mother's love, and its little feelings are put on edge constantly. Homesickness, and it's breaking its little heart, and its whole world seems insecure. It's thrust out into it when it isn't ready for such a responsibility. Self and selfishness. And very often I say it's done not because they have to do it, but because it's the thing to do. And they're afraid of criticism of other members of the class if they don't do it. It's nothing but pride and selfishness. And so the child's life is affected at the very beginning. And when you think of broken marriages and divorce and separation and the havoc it can play in a sensitive little child's mind and heart, why, I say such children are not given a chance. It's not surprising that their whole world is shaking and they don't know where to turn or what to lean on. Their whole world is insecure and it's the result of self in its various forms. And I could keep you at great length in analyzing this terrible business and in showing you how all along the line it is the central cause of trouble a wife not trusting her husband. The husband can't trust the wife. All along they're on edge. They don't know. And it's because each one is selfish. That's the major cause of the modern problem. But there is another, and it's this. That man today is living for this world only. 
And you see, he is depending for his happiness upon this world. He gets his pleasure and his happiness and his joy and his peace, so-called, from entertainments outside himself. And he's become absolutely dependent upon these things. He's the slave and the victim of the social round and the thing to do. And here he is bound by these things. Well, now suddenly there is a threat of war. And of course, a war seems to threaten all these things. The things they've lived for suddenly seem to be taken away from them. And so they're terrified. They're alarmed. They've been going on in that way. But war will put an end to that. What do we do then? What do we fall back upon? They're absolutely dependent on these things and in their grip. And they're afraid of anything that tends to disturb the regular round. They're terrified of an illness. They're terrified of death. They're terrified of war. They're terrified of a financial crash. A financial loss and all these things. Why? Well, because all that they've lived for suddenly will go. And they're left to themselves. That is perhaps the best way of all of putting it. The ultimate fear of the modern man is the fear of being alone with himself. It's the one thing that terrifies him. To be alone with yourself. What can I do, he says. Because he's always dependent upon others and things outside himself. But these things threaten to isolate him and leave him alone. The loneliness of life, the loneliness of dying alone, the loneliness of going on to an unknown eternity. These are the things. Well, there I've mentioned the other factors. The fear of death. The fear of conscience. The fear of God. The fear of judgment. The fear that after all, perhaps the Bible is right. And that there is a God. And that there is a judgment after this life. And that there is a heaven and a hell. What if it's true? And suddenly we'll be made to face it. These are the things that account for the fear of the modern men according to the teaching of the scripture. Now the Lord Jesus Christ not only exposes the cause of our ills, But thank God, having exposed it, he can cure it. The gospel doesn't merely delight to convict us of sin, it convicts us of sin that it may lead us to repentance and then to salvation and redemption. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. How does he do it? Well, he does it first and foremost by convicting us of the truth of what I've been trying to say by means of his Holy Spirit. He just gives me this picture of myself and I say that's absolutely true. That is me. There I am. I see it now. He says very well, as long as you're like that, you'll never know peace. Because your whole view of yourself is wrong and your view of God is wrong. But we've got to see this. We've got to see that we were never meant to live like that. That we were meant to live for God and under God's blessing and benediction. That we were made for God, that we are meant for God. And that in correspondence with God we can live like that. Here is the Son of God speaking, you see. He was in this world, the world of sin that you and I are in and all the troubles and the problems, you know, he went through it in perfect peace. And he says, I can enable you to do the same thing. I'll give you my peace, the peace that I know myself, in spite of all that men do to me. And here he is speaking about his own death, the cruel death and the cross. And he says, my peace I give to you. The disciples are in a state of acute unrest. They're worried about him and about themselves. He says, I'm the one who's going to die, and I'll give you my peace. How does he do it? Well, he does it, of course, by introducing us to God. The moment you see yourself as you are and as the cause of your own restlessness, you see at once that you've sinned against God and the law of your being, and you say, well, how can I find God? How can I know God? If God can give me peace, how can I arrive at God? And the first thing you see is I must 
Be forgiven. I need forgiveness. How can I be forgiven? And here Christ comes in with his answer. He says, my peace, the peace I'm going to purchase for you. I'm going to that cross. Let not your hearts be troubled. I'm going there. Why? Because, well, you'll never know peace unless I go. I'm going to bear your sins. I'm going to take your punishment upon myself. I'm going to reconcile you to God and make you his children. And then he will shower his blessings upon you. But it isn't merely a question of forgiveness, you know. He gives us his own nature. He gives us his own life. He gives us himself. That's an essential part of this New Testament teaching. You can have a new mind, a new outlook. Indeed, you're a new man. You're in the same world, but you're a new man. And because you're a new man, you see everything else in a different way. You've got an entirely new view of yourself. You've got an entirely new view of life in this world. You've got a new view of how life is to be lived. No longer running away from things, but looking at them in the strength that Christ supplies. Living a life of holiness as he lived, right with God, going on. Yes, and even able to look into the face of death. Because if you're a Christian, when you look into the face of death, you see through it, you see beyond it. You see that death is nothing but the door that opens a way of entry into a bliss, into a glory, into a life of peace and joy that baffles description. That's how our Lord did it, you see, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He looked through it, beyond it, to the glory that he knew he was going into. And he says, I'll give you my peace. As Christians, we enjoy this peace because we have long since come to see and to know that this is only a passing world and that doesn't terrify us. Death doesn't terrify us. Whatever the world may do, it cannot touch the land to which I now belong, the place that God hath prepared for them that love him. Listen to our Lord saying it. Let not your heart be troubled. He believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. My dear friend, what a fool a man is to think that this is the only world and the only life. And that if a war comes, it's all gone. And if I go, well, what then? My dear friend, that is life. Brief life is here our portion, at best. And whether you go out of this life as the result of a war or a hydrogen bomb or not, you've got to go out of it. And if you realize that beyond it there remains for you one of these mansions which Christ has built and prepared for you. Why, I can see a day coming, you know, when you will come up to the standard of those great martyrs in the first centuries of the Christian church who when they were thrown to the lions in the arena were heard to the amazement of everybody thanking God that at last they'd been allowed to suffer shame for his name's sake. They called that their crowning day, the crown of glory, the wreath of glory, was placed upon their brows. Peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, thank God. Let not your heart therefore be troubled, neither let it be afraid. 
Have you got this peace, my friend? You either have or you haven't. You're either afraid of life as it is tonight. Or you can look at it steadily, fixedly, and say, yes, I needn't shut off the wireless. I needn't put off that television. I needn't drown my sorrows. Or somehow or another try to persuade myself that all is going to be well. With the strength that the Son of God supplies, I'll go on doing my duty day by day, knowing that nothing shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yea, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. If you haven't got the peace, rush to him, go to him, confess it to him, accept his diagnosis, confess your sin, and ask him to receive you and to cleanse you with his blood from all your sin and to give you life anew, and he will receive you. Him that cometh unto me, he says, I will in no wise cast out. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.